Proverbs chapter number 1. I'm going to read one verse this morning, verse number 19. So are the ways of everyone that is greedy of gain, which taketh away the life of the owners thereof. Now, we're 19 verses into the book of Proverbs. I don't have time to cover everything that's already happened. And go back and read it. You'll find that Solomon in his introductory chapter is going through a few of the things. Granted, if you read it, he wrote this to one of his children initially. Why? To guide them after he's gone. To pass down to their children and their children. So by the time we get to verse number 19, he's already talked about those that follow the instruction of the Lord and those that don't. Well, by 19, we get down to those that have an attribute that he calls of greedy gain, or greedy of gain. Now, we all know what gain is. Everybody would like gain, right? I don't think it's wrong or, it's, you know, not spiritual for anybody in here today to say, if gain were to come my way, I'd be okay with it. Right? Gain is a good thing. I mean, the reason that we plan is why? To reap, right? We sow in order to get more. And we don't sow to put into the ground to get exactly what we put into the ground out. No, when you put a seed in, then it bears fruit. Well, what's in that fruit? More seed. You get more than what you put in. Right? And be not deceived. God is not mocked. If you sow it, you're going to reap it. Right? That's one of the ways that God ordained the universe. If you put effort and labor in, there's going to be gain from it. Now, depending on what you put that effort and labor into, gain may turn into harm real quick. Gain may turn into loss. But that depends on what you're putting into the ground. But see, problem's not gain. But there are a lot of people that get up and preach to tell you that if you have this or you have that or if you, know, you desire to have this or that, that makes you wrong with God. Well, show me a chapter and verse on it. Job was the wealthy, wealthiest man in all the East. Yet he was still right with God. God called him a perfect man. man and his faith was complete. He was an upright man who feared God and eschewed evil. Job was right with God. And for lack of a better term, Job had everything in the world. Job had so much that they knew that God had blessed him. The princes would come and ask Job for counsel when they didn't know what to do. Now imagine the president coming and asking you for advice today and then taking it seriously. Right, but that's what they did in Job's day. The princes would come out and say, Job, what do you think about this? We present, what would you do in this situation, Job? And then they would do what he said. That means a whole lot. Right? Gain's not the problem. What's the problem? It's they are greedy of gain. Right? Greed is an insatiable desire. What's that mean? You can't ever quench greed. You can't ever satisfy greed. The problem with greed is that you have, you want more, you get more, and you still want more. Nothing's ever enough for greed. Same thing as jealousy. If you're jealous of somebody, it doesn't matter what you have and what they have, you're going to find something to be jealous of in their life. Same is true of bitterness. It doesn't matter what's going on around. If you're bitter, you're going to find something to be bitter about. Right? Those that have a hateful spirit, you can put them smack dab in the middle of Disney World. Happiest place on earth. And what's going to happen? They're still going to be hateful about something. Right? Who cares if the tur turkey leg costs $40 or whatever they cost nowadays? If the Disneyland turkey leg, eat it and be happy. Right? There are just people that are going to find something to be hateful or to be jealous or to be greedy about. Well, see, the danger with greed, I mean, last week we talked about pride. This week we're talking about greed. What's going on? I don't know. Maybe we'll get through all the seven deadly sins, as some people call them, and then we'll move on. I don't know. But right? greed, in verse number 19, he says, so are the ways of everyone that is greedy of gain. What's he saying? Doesn't matter who you are. 
Doesn't matter where you come from. Doesn't matter what you have, what other people have. Doesn't matter how your life has been up to that point. Doesn't matter how you was raised or everything. Everybody that's got greed in their heart, they all walk the same path. Which makes sense. What does sin do to everyone? Well, eventually it leads to death. What did it do to Adam and Eve? They fell out of God's favor. What does sin do today? It separates you from God. Truly, what was the sin that Adam and Eve committed? Well, they disobeyed. We know that. But why did they disobey? Well, Eve disobeyed because she believed the serpent rather than God. And Adam partook of the fruit because he wanted Eve more than he wanted God. Well, what did that do? They decided that they didn't want... The, the enticing thing to Eve was, ye shall become as God. They wanted to be like God. Now, I mean, scripturally, there's nothing wrong with that. One of these days, you're going to be like Jesus. You're going to be exactly like Him. You're going to have a body like His. We're going to be where He's at. We're going to see Him as He is. We know the flesh can't see Him and live. So what's that mean? We're going to be like Him in order to see Him. We're going to be like the Lord. But the problem is that they wanted to be Lord, just like Satan wanted to be Lord, which is why Lucifer got kicked out of heaven. You know what the root of greed is? You want something that God doesn't want you to have. In truth, that's what greed is. You want it. But why do you want it? Because you want it. I don't know why you think it might make you happy. Guess what? It's not going to make you happy. And when you get it, you're going to be greedy for something else. In truth, I got a theory. can't prove it. I'm not a psychologist. You know, I don't study people. People are weird. I don't want to study people. Right? But truly, greed is a sickness that always gives you something to do. You're so miserable without something to do that you conjure up things in your mind that you have to have in order to go out and labor for them. Greed, according to this verse, so are the ways of everyone that is greedy of gain which taketh away the life of the owners thereof. In other words, he's saying greed takes away from the life of those that are greedy. He says greed is a truly two-edged sword. You're going out and hacking, trying to get whatever it is that you want, but on every stroke back you're cutting yourself. The act of being greedy will rob you of your very life. And I don't believe that he's just talking about the physical life here. I believe he's talking about the quality of your life. I believe he's talking about the peace in your life. I believe that he's talking about every aspect of your life, the relationships in your life, okay, the purpose of your life. What he's saying, Brother Jordan, greed, you're going out trying to get something, and no matter how much you get, greed's robbing you. I don't know if y'all know what a Ponzi scheme is. But a Ponzi scheme is where they make great verbose promises. Hey, you give me this amount of money within a year, I'll be able to double it. Well, while they're telling you that, they go out and they ask a whole bunch of more money from everybody else, saying, look, we've already got all these investors. We'll be able to do for you what they do for them. Except they never do anything with the money that people are investing. They take it and they spend it and they go buy yachts and super fast cars and houses out in the hills. Right? And they keep lying to the other people, paying off the first investors with the money that's coming in from the new investors. They're saying, well, here's your dividends. We made money. They no, didn't. You just took money from over here and gave it to the first people. You took the first people's money and you went out and you started living like billionaires. And now you just have to keep recruiting more people to keep paying everybody else off. But they called a pyramid or a Ponzi scheme because the only people getting money are those at the top. The people that put their money in first, guess what? They lose it. The people that put their money in at the end, guess what happens? They lose it. Okay, Enron, one of the biggest Ponzi schemes of all time, if y'all remember that. What happened? People were greedy of gain. I'm not saying there's anything wrong in investing. If God tells you to invest, it's a smart reason. You know, a lot of good reasons to invest. Invest in good stuff. 
don't invest in all that fooey crypto coin. Right? Invest in stuff that is proven. Okay? Nothing wrong with PNG. Okay? Or gold. That's a good one too. But anyway. That hedges your bets against inflation. Anyway. Jordan's investing tips over this Sunday. But anyway. What do you say? But investing's not the problem. Some people invest for security. Right? Why do you invest? So that you have a way to accumulate well after you retire. That money's there. Hopefully it grows because the business grows or whatever you've invested in grows. Right? So that when you retire, you've got some money to live off of. Nothing wrong with that. But there is something wrong with people that take everything that they have, everything that everybody else around them has, on a harebrained, lunatic investment, right, just a whim, and then they put everything in, and then they bankrupt everybody that they know. What happened? They were greedy of gain. Remember, gain's the goal. Some people are just hoarders. I don't think that that counts as greedy of gain. They don't want anything else. They just want everything that they've ever owned at the same time. Right? And they've got it all stacked in their house. Greedy of gain is it's not focused on what you have. It's focused on what you don't have and how you can get it. Right? In fact, the Bible talks about being good stewards of the things that God's blessed you with. I don't think it's greedy to say, I want to take care of the things that God's blessed me with. I want to do right by what God's done for me. I want to be faithful with what He's entrusted me with. But also, I don't want to take advantage of what God's given me. I want to appreciate it. I don't think that's greedy. In fact, according to your Bible, it's required among stewards that a man be found faithful. But in addition to that, we can look at somebody like Esau. The Bible says that he despised the grace of God. That means that he thought the grace of God had no value. Everything that God gave Esau, Esau gave away. He was only interested in things that he wanted. How'd that turn out for him? Not too good. He lost his birthright because he sold it for a bowl of soup and, you know, basically some vegetables. What happened to his blessing? His brother stole it from him. And then you study it out. His people eat them. What happened? Essentially, they were slaves to Israel. All because of what? Because somebody wanted gain to the point that he became greedy. And you know that, Brother Jordan, because any hunter worth his salt doesn't go out and hunt when he's hungry. He hunts before he gets hungry. But it says Esau went out and he needed to hunt and he came back hungry. That means he didn't take food with him. Any hunter knows how to get food if you really need it. Trust me, I get it. I like cow. But I like cow good. Goat, not too, not too familiar with goat. But if there's no cow around, I'm going to kill a goat. And we're going to find out what goat tastes like. Right? I'm not going to be greedy for the cow when you're hungry. Right? If there's no goat, there might be rabbit or we might, go to, we might go chief's route and go possum or squirrel or something else. Right? Beggars don't get to be choosers. What happened? Esau was getting choosy. He came back hungry. You're telling me a hunter doesn't know what bushes can feed you? No, he wanted the prestige of coming back with the big antler deer. He wanted everybody else to say, wow, how in the world did you kill that, Esau? What happened? He got so hungry, he was willing to give everything that God ever gave him away for one meal. He was desperate. Why? Because he got greedy. Well, those that are greedy of gain, what happens? It taketh away the life of the owners thereof. First thing that greed is going to rob you of in your life is it will take your physically, it'll take away your life. If you're always out laboring, it's going to take a toll on this body. This body is not eternal. I don't think it's, or did, Brother Ray. All them years hanging off buildings by tiptoes, right? Like stringing things up. All them skyscrapers down in Cincinnati. All the times you spend on your hands and knees. You got a little bit of arthritis, don't you? Yeah. 
But that arthritis, what that's a result of work. Well, imagine if he got greedy and he worked twice as much as he does now, he wouldn't be able to move. Right? There's a difference between hard work and too much work. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that you're supposed to work yourself to the bone. No, Jesus came that you were to have life and life more abundantly. God wants you to have a better life. You know what greed will cause you to do? Work your life away. You know what the problem with the world nowadays is? First off, godliness is contentment. Hang on. Godliness with contentment is a great game. If you're content with what God gave you, you're not greedy. You know what the world's problem is? They don't know what contentment is. There's a whole lot out there that if God gave it to me, I'd be happy with it. Again, there's no problem with gain. What's the problem when you want that so much that you're willing to work instead of doing what God wants you to do? In order to be greedy, you've got to give up on certain things in your life. First thing, it's going to be if, it's, if you're working all the time, it's going to show under your eyes. Eventually, you're going to go see a doctor and they're going to have to put you on some kind of medication either to make you go to sleep or to make you wake up or to make you feel like you're not you know, coming apart at the ends because you're running every which way but loose. You think that's what God intended for you? That you work yourself to insanity? Or you work yourself into a wheelchair? Or you work yourself away from your family? What's the next thing that life, when it comes to says robs the life? Those that are greedy. Well, what's a big part of your life? People. In fact, God chose people to win other people. The reason you got saved was because of people. The reason that God left you here after you got saved was because of people. The reason God puts you in a family, not just church family, but in a real family, because God expected those people around you to be supports to you. God intended those people to be right, those that would bear up your burdens so fulfill the law of Christ. God put you in a church family because he knew that you needed church family. Because sometimes your own family it not worth plug nickel. But if you get in the family of God and people show the right kind of love, right, the people around the house of God are going to be closer than the actual family. You got more in common with them spiritually than you do with the regular family. So what you, you're going to hang out with those that you have a good time with. But see, if you've got greed, you don't have time to fellowship because you're out chasing something. If you're chasing gain to the point that you're willing to start sacrificing, you're going to start sacrificing people. I guarantee you, you're going to start sacrificing time around the house. God, we'll get to that here in a second. But you're going to start sacrificing people. Well, all of a sudden, it's not so important that you go to all the so-and-so's practices and so-and-so's games. All of a sudden, it's not so important that you have dinner every night with your family. Maybe if you just have dinner with them every other night, then that'll be cut down to a couple of nights. Then Sunday only. And then, they don't know what it's like to have mom or dad at the table any longer. Right? It's not so important to spend time with your kids and raising them in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, teaching them the principles and the oracles of God. We'll let the school system raise them. Well, how's that turned out? Right? The thing about people and you, this Bible talks about how God invested in you, how you're supposed to invest in the souls of other people. You're supposed to invest in the lives of other people. You're to take no thought of your life or your needs because he promised that he'd take care of your needs. You're supposed to be concerned with the needs of others. If you're greedy for gain, you don't care about how much other people have. All you care about is what you have. So what happens? You start cutting other people out that you think have too much that they don't need your help. Greed's real good at putting blinders on and thinking, oh, well, they can take care of it. If I can take care of it, they can take care of it. Maybe not. Maybe God puts you in their life because you were able to help them overcome it. See, greed 
and being greedy for gain will cause you to walk away from those that you're closest to. Why? Because you're chasing some pipe dream. You just want more, not realizing that God already gave you the most important things that you could ever own. The most cherished things in your life, if you're right with God, are not things, they are people. They are the Savior. They are the Savior's house. They are the mission that the Savior gave you. They are not things that can be grabbed. That faith is the essence of things, up for the evidence of things I've seen. You can't put your hand on it, but you know that it's real. Well, if you're chasing gain, guess what? You don't believe it until you can grab it. You can't lay a hand on you know, the material, the physical importance of having somebody in your life that taught you what thus saith the Lord. You think that Sunday school is enough to raise kids? You think kids club or teens club is enough to instill into them the principles that they're going to need? No. Was it enough for you? No. You think that one or two services, three services a week, compared to how much they're being relented and battered and beaten down by the world, trying to get them to cave and to buy in, you think that's going to be enough? No. No. But when you're greedy for gain and you leave those people that God's put in your life, you abandon them is what you do. Who do you think is going to be there to pick up the pieces and promise them that everything's going to be okay? The world. All because you wanted something or someone or some ideal that you're chasing after. All for what? That you go all in for that and leave everything else behind. Think about people that are chasing something. If you're not with them, they just leave you by the side of the road. If you're not on the bandwagon, then they're going to throw you off the bandwagon. They don't care about you anymore. They only care about what's going on in front of them, what they're headed toward. Not well, it says that those that are greedy of gain, that greed taketh away the life of the owners thereof. You know what I find peculiar in the way that God wrote that verse? Greed takes away the life of the owners thereof. What does greed say? Greed says, give me more. You can't own greed. Greed's an infection. You can't put your hands on greed. Right, but what does greed want you to do? Greed did more more you can never own enough but greed if it's down in here it owns you greed takes away the life of the owners thereof you may have a little jar that you think is greed and that you've got a cap on it but greed really owns you you've got your hand around it but it's got a hand around your heart Really, if you're greedy, the only thing that you own is that greed. Because nothing else will satisfy you. You're willing to throw everything away that you have in order to chase after something else. But if you own it, what's that life that it's talking about? It's talking about your spiritual life. You really think that you're going to get in here and early will I seek thee? Write that word if I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. That you've studied to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. You think that you're going to be chasing after that goal in your life if instead you could go get a little bit more extra overtime down at the factory. See, that's the thing about the world. If you want to give yourself to them for just a couple of dollars, they'll let you do it. They'll let you work as much as you want. If one job won't, I've seen help wanted signs at every fast food joint I've been to for four months. There's somebody out there that'll give you way less than what you need for everything that you're willing to give them. And employers aren't the only one. There are people that'll let you give them a whole lot and they're willing to give you a whole little back. 
You're giving away your spiritual life. Why? Because those things that God asks us to do, really, they don't take that much effort. You know what the effort is? It don't take a lot to sit down and read. don't take a lot to sit down and pray. If you've started off the day on the right foot with God. If you started off walking hand in hand in the Spirit with God, sitting down and reading the Word of God's a treat. You know what the effort comes in? When you've got to kneel before an almighty God and say, Lord, I was wrong, I repent of what I've been doing, and you've got to get right with God. If you's all right, I mean, if you's already right with God, it's real easy to sit down and pray. Because you're going to pray with the Spirit leads you to pray. It's real easy to read, because He's already done all the hard work. The Spirit's going to lead and guide you into all truth. You know what you're going to read? What the Holy Ghost wants you to read. You know what you're going to see? What the Holy Ghost wants you to see. You know what you're going to do when you walk out the front door in the day? Well, if he pulls on one of the reins, you're going to turn that direction. If he doesn't pull on the reins, you're going to do what you know God wants you to do that day. This real easy life. The hard part is keeping the flesh out the way. Well, why is that a problem? Because the flesh is greedy. And the flesh will say, well, instead of reading... For 30 minutes in the morning, we can cut that down to 15. We can cut that down to 10. We can cut that down to 5. You woke up late today, might as well just skip reading the Bible this morning so that you're not late to work. Right? I've seen all the crazy things that people do in their car. Women eating breakfast, drinking a, you know, coffee, talking on the phone, putting makeup on, looking in the rear view mirror, and somehow that car's still moving forward. I don't get it. She's got four hands. I don't know where them came from. Right? None of them are on the steering wheel. How's that car moving? I don't know, but she found a way to get to work on time. If you're serious enough about reading your Bible, you're going to find time to read your Bible. But what does greed say? Well, we can do it later. Or you can do it less. And little by little, what's it do? It's robbing you of your spirituality. I don't have to fellowship with people after church I'm just you know there I'm here to there to hear the preaching well you may be there to hear the preaching but what if God wants to worship that Sunday morning what if it just gets a little bit too big in here and then something happened to where there is no preaching you gonna walk out disappointed with God you see greed will give you expectations in the rest of your life as long as you check those boxes then you feel good about going after and pursuing whatever it is that you're pursuing well, I texted my mom and dad today and told them that I loved them. That makes me a good son. No, don't. Right? Well, I've read so many verses in my Bible. That makes me right with God. Now I can go work all this extra overtime. Now I can go and, you know, invest time into this. The whole point of what greed wants you to do is to get to a point where you're willing to settle. Show me chapter and verse where it's a Christian, you're supposed to settle for anything. I find that the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church of the living God. We're supposed to grab every inch of hell that we can. We're supposed to claw and scrape and do all that we can do to help reach those souls that are dying and going on the way. And according to your Bible, hell can't stop you. But yet hell enlarges its borders every day. You know what that tells me? There's too many people that are willing to settle. They're willing to settle for their family being saved. What about those that their family never darkened the doors of a church? What about those that were indoctrinated in a false religion, made twofold the child of hell? Well, my family's made professions of faith. Doesn't mean that they got saved one. If you're in, you changed. If you're still the same after you made a profession, you didn't get in. That's not my opinion. That's a book. Come see me after Sunday school. I'll give you all the verses you want. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things pass away, behold, all things become new. What are you saying? We're okay to settle. Well, I've got this, so now I can go chase that. 
Right? My kids don't act like complete heathens. They just act like hillbillies. Or rednecks. Or not to leave Miss Billy out, they act like mountaineers. Okay? There you go. What do you say? Well, they they put a little bit of, they're not the dumbest kid at school. Right? We laugh at that. But yeah, you say, well, I'm not the least spiritual person in the building. Either you are spiritual or you aren't. There's no scale. Either your family's right with God or it ain't. Right? Either those that desire to see the world saved. You know what that means? It doesn't matter to them if it's a family member or a complete stranger. They're willing to go and tell. Why? Because they believe that's what God wants them to do. But other people are settled and say, well, I've reached my Jerusalem. Really? You've, you've reached your entire hometown? But the house live on a street that's named after them. Right? But yet their Jerusalem's bigger than that street. We think our Jerusalem's what you can see. Nope. Your Jerusalem's where you was born. Judea's around that. Samaria and uttermost parts of the world. Your spirituality is to be as much like Christ as you possibly can. And then expect God to do the rest. To transform you into what you can't be. He made you a new creature. Well, what's the new creature supposed to be? Like Christ. He knew we couldn't do that. That's why he robed us in his righteousness. That's why he promised that he would do the work. But what do we have to do? We've got to be obedient. But what does greed cause you to do? Settle for benchmarks. Well, as long as I'm above this line, I'm okay. Says who? Technically, as long as you're above empty, you're good to go. But how far are you going to get? When your spirituality is tested, how much you really got in the tank? You're going to find out that greed robbed you of a whole lot of it. Because you were willing to let it go lower and lower and lower and lower. Why? Because it would have taken effort away from what you wanted in order to fill the gas tank back up. It says it robs you of your life. We've alluded to it. Esau gave away everything that got. Lot did the same thing. God blessed Lot greatly. I mean, blessed him so much that his servants and Abraham served, or Abram's servants at the time, Abram's servants, couldn't get along no more. Right? They were very wealthy, very successful men. Abram gave the choice a lot. Wherever you go, I'll go the other direction so that there's no problems between you and me. They went separate ways because they desired the fellowship and the relationship of each other so much. They didn't split up because they didn't like each other. They split up so that they could stay great friends, great relatives, that there wouldn't be any strife between them. Lot looked, and it says that the cities of the plain looked as the very garden of God. Well, God only made one garden, and that was Eden. Now you say, well, I wouldn't have gone down that way. You got It's pretty hard to look at the garden of Eden and say, nah, I don't want that. I believe Lot went down there with all intentions. Right? If he planned on living in a city, why did he care about the gardens? Why did he care about the fields? He was a herdsman. He saw the grass and he's like, man, they're going to get fat eating that. We're going to be in good shape. But where do you find them by the time them angels come to grab them out of Sodom and Gomorrah? He's given everything that God had ever blessed him. He's traded it away for something. And what did he do? He lost everything that God ever gave him. The only thing that he had left was what God instilled into him, what Abram had taught him about the things of God. The Bible still called him a righteous man, just lot in the New Testament, meaning that he was justified. The only thing he had left was what was done on the inside. But what he lose? He ended up losing everything. By the end of it, very wife turned around and turned into a pillar of salt. What are you saying, Brother Jordan? 
All them sheep that God blessed them with, he decided that they weren't as important as chasing after something. He had a very important place in the city. He was a judge. He was in charge of the gate. The gate's where you went and did business. If there was a dispute, guess who they wanted the opinion of? Lot. Because they knew that Lot knew the difference between good and evil, right and wrong. And they knew that they were so heathenistic that they didn't know the difference between good and evil, so they put Lot in the judge's seat. Said, you tell us what's right and what's wrong. He had a whole lot in the world's eyes, but what did he give up? Everything that God ever gave him. He lost all his family except two daughters, and what happened? They did wrong by the dad. Everything that he had traded away to gain wealth, and guess what happened? It got burned up with fire. Guess what happened to everything that Esau desired? It went up in smoke. That blessing that he was supposed to be the, receive the chief blessing. That his nation would be far and wide and that his people would be the people of God. He didn't get that blessing. You know what he got to do? He got to serve his younger brother. He got to be a slave and his descendants were essentially slaves to the one that he sold his birthright to. And all the while he's thinking, that could have been me. That could have been me. Even after he had lost everything, he couldn't kick the greed. How do you know? Because he wanted what Jacob had. A couple of times he tried to kill him. Why? Because he wanted what he used to have. That's the thing. It doesn't matter that you used to have it. Greed wants it now. You're not willing to go through the effort to get it again. You want it now. You see how greed doesn't make sense? It never will make sense. Greed only makes sense to the person that's going through it. And it never makes sense after the fact. It only makes sense during the fact. You know, that sounds like a bad plan. Hey, we're going to drive this car as fast as we can, and it's going to go great, but if it doesn't, then we'll learn from it later. That's a bad plan. How about you do everything you can now to make sure that everything's going to go smoothly? How about you appreciate what you have, and instead of trying to push everything to the limit, to get as much as you can, as quick as you can, how about you just enjoy what God gave you, and then you let God take care of all the things that are too big for you, and you go out and do what God entrusts you to do it. You say, well, that's simple. That's not a life that the world would appreciate. Good. Because if the world appreciates it, it's junk. thought we were supposed to pursue after gold, silver, and precious gems. That we were supposed to lay up our treasures in a place called the kingdom of heaven. That we were supposed to be interested in things that moth and rust and the flame that this world's going to be burned up in one day can't touch. Well, you know what moths can touch? Anything made by human hands. You know what rust can touch? Anything that made out of metal and exposed to oxygen. Well, there's a whole lot of it around because that's what you need to breathe. Hey, well, you say, well, we, we've got stainless steel. Nick the surface of that stainless steel fork and see how long it's stainless. This world's going to cut you up and chew up everything you've got. You think it's not going to rust? Well, my car's got paint on it to keep it from rusting. Well, what happens when somebody, you know, hits that shopping cart into the door? How quick it going to rust after that? Well, that's not what I did to it. No, it's what the world did to it, because the world wants to rob you of everything so they can keep you on the hook. The world wants to keep dangling that, like that stupid Geico commercial. The reason I still remember it is because they, <laughs> when Hillary lost the election, is that old man with the fishing pole and the $1 bill on it, and he's dangling it over at Hillary's head, except it's the White House, and he says, Ooh, you almost had it. <laughs> but that guy with the dollar bill, Oh, you almost had it. It's a dollar bill, and it's Geico. If they ain't dangling a million off of it, I ain't jumping for it. Really? A dollar, Geico? But there are some people, you could hang a nickel on it, and they're going to jump until they can't jump no more, trying to get it. Why? Because they want it. They need it. Got to have it. 
They just want to keep you on the hook. So they'll give you something, but they're going to find a way to take it away. And say, well, no, that's not what you need. You need this. You need that. Greed isn't just about gain of this. Greed just isn't about a gain of, you know, things. Right? Monetary possessions. It's not about knickknacks or it's not about going and collecting this or doing that. No, greed is about a hunger for something to where you're willing to forsake everything else. We already said, God expects you to be good stewards of what He gave you. God never wants you to forsake that which He's already blessed you with in order to go out and try to get something else. No, God wants you to be content with what God gave you. If He wants you to be content with it, that means that you plan on living with it. It means you plan on keeping it. One of the great lies of greed is that, well, you don't need that anymore. If God gave it to you, you better keep it. You better use it. Why? Because He promised to take care of all your needs. So if He gave it to you, it's because you either need it now or you're going to need it. You say, well, Brother Jordan, what's the difference between gain and greed? Gain, truly, is because God wanted you to have it. Greed is giving away what you got to try and get something else. Greed is willing to go bankrupt chasing after a drink. God never wants you to be bankrupt. God doesn't want you to be spiritually bankrupt. Doesn't want you to be emotionally bankrupt. Doesn't want you to be mentally bankrupt. God wants you to be of sound mind. God wants you to be able to minister unto others. How are you going to do that if you're empty everywhere? God wants you to be able to be a light unto others. How are you going to burn without any oil? God doesn't want you bankrupt. God wants you to take what He's given you and use it to the glory and the honor of the Lord. Greed wants you to give everything away to try and chase after this thing that's going to make you happy. Happy ain't a place. Happy ain't a person. Happy is an emotion. And depending on what the doctor puts into you, or depending on, you know, if you go to the dentist, they give you some of that laughing gas. Happy can come real quick a whole bunch of different ways. There's a whole bunch of different ways that people chase after happy. Guess what? They never find it. Because happy is not a state of being. You know what it is? Peace, joy, love, faith. Those things that you can take upon that solid rock, which is our Savior, and layer them together and build a truly stable life. Not because of anything that we've done, but because we're built on the right foundation. But what does greed want? Greed wants you to start taking things out like a Jenga tower. And saying, well, we can live without this bit. Maybe for a time. But eventually you're going to go to pull one where you wish that that one you'd taken out about eight moves ago was still in there. Greed will cause you to rip out everything that you can afford and then it's going to start asking you to take things out of your life that you can't afford, hoping for more. But we just want to get that tower a little bit taller. Well, if you was happy with the tower you started with, it wouldn't be in danger of tipping over if somebody walked by it too fast. You ever had that happen? Somebody walked past the table, bumped the table, and it was your turn and you lost because somebody bumped the table? That wasn't my fault. That was their fault. Doesn't matter. It was my tower. It fell over. Well, it's not my fault that, you know, I'm... All this stuff fell apart? Yeah, it is, because you started yanking things out of it and expecting it to stay there. But life is not a game of Jenga. Okay, life isn't a game of Battleship or Risk or any other board game you want, or Monopoly or Life, the game Life. Life is truly life and death. What you do today adds eternal consequences for yourself, for your, those around you, because you've written epistles known and read of all men. And to those that you may never meet or see, what you do today can reach them and have everlasting impacts. Or you can be willing to sacrifice all of it. Why? To chase after something. 
because you just want more. You know what the world's problem is? They want more. You know what the church's problem is? They want more. Things. They want more of this. They want more of that. Very few people are saying, give me more of God. You know who's satisfied and who's going out and who's not greedy? Who's living on the blessings of God, doing the work of God? Those that are saying, give me more God. See, greed's going to rob you of your very life. And greed it, and as we said, chasing after her. Some people say, this is greed. No, greed's just when you say, give me that. And I'm willing to chase after it with everything I have. Did you know that IBC is now on iTunes, TuneIn, SoundCloud, and Google Play? Head on over to your podcast provider and subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.